Okay, we're now live to go. Thanks very much, Ewan. So welcome to today's meeting of the Leicestershire, Leicester and Rutland Health Scrutiny, uh, Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which is being held online. And uh, we've just been informed that the meeting is now live uh, and it's live on YouTube. Uh, for those not able to watch the footage live, it will be uh, the webcast will be available uh, for viewing after the meeting. Uh, so can I firstly ask that participants in the meeting try and avoid using the Microsoft Teams chat facility um, and keep comments in the, in the public part of the meeting unless you have a technical problem which needs resolving. Um, and also, can I ask that officers and members make their micro mute their microphones until they wish or are invited to speak? When you're speaking, please make sure your video is turned on as well so we can all see you. I now have to do a roll call, basically, of, of, of our members to make sure you can all see and hear. Um, for the start with Councillor Aldred. Who's there? Sorry, Chair. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> I thought I saw your name. Uh, uh, Councillor Chamund? Not seen. Uh, no, right. I think, I think uh, Councillor Chamund will be joining us later today. Oh. Thanks very much. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Councillor Fonseca. No, don't see them on the list. No, can't see them. Uh, Councillor Hack. I've seen you. I can see you. <laughs> Hi, Councillor Felton. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Harvey. Hello, I'm here. Thank you. Very much. Councillor Dr Hill. I'm here. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Kittrick. Uh, present. Thanks, Patrick. Councillor March, have you come back yet? Yeah. I I think... And uh, Councillor Morgan. Hello there, Chair. I'm here. Okay. Oh, Councillor Fons Fonseca has just arrived. Uh, uh, Councillor Orson. Councillor Mrs Page. Good morning. I can see and hear you. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Parton. <laughs> Councillor Sangster. <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Waller. I've seen you. Yes, you are. I, I see you, Gail. Yeah. Yes, I am here, and good morning, everybody. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, Councillor Westley, yes, I've seen you and spoken to you. Um, and just to go back, uh, Councillor Fonseca, I think you've now joined us, haven't you? Yep. Uh, yes, yes, Chair. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Sorry, I had some problem. Yeah. yeah, it happens to all of us, Hadley. Right. Um, lovely. And I've uh, also got um, from uh, Health Watch, uh, we've got Mukesh Barrow. Are you with us? Not yet. Uh, and I've seen this one. Uh, and, and Dr. Janet Underwood, I've seen you somewhere. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> yes, thanks, Janet. I knew I'd seen you somewhere. Um, lovely. OK. Um, right. Uh, <laughs> so item one on the agenda is minutes of the meeting held on the 15th of October. Um, I propose the minutes of the meeting held on the 15th are taken as read, confirmed and signed. Are people OK with that? OK, thanks, Ted. Thanks very much. OK, agreed. Uh, question time. We've had uh, 13, I think it is, questions from members of the public uh, for today's meeting. Um, and of those, 11 have indicated they'd like to ask supplementaries. Rather than break the meeting up, I thought it was better to put those questions immediately before the reconfiguration report, which is only in uh, a few minutes, but I think it just makes it a bit easier to, to put it in the right place. And the other point to make out to those asking supplementaries, please keep your supplementaries absolutely relevant to the question you asked and the answer you've had. Because if they're straying off line, 
I shall cut you off. Um, I'm sorry, but that's the way the rules are. So keep them to the to, to the to the point, please. Um, questions asked by members. We'll do that now because they're although they're relevant. Uh, I think it might be worth asking. Um, uh, Terry Iner, I gather you've got a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'll um, just get myself organised on here. Uh, uh, well, uh, clearly on my question, I, I don't actually have an answer, um, uh, which, which, to be honest, I find a little surprising, Chair. Um, so <coughs> uh, what I would like to understand is uh, why is this information not already known uh, when plans are already underway? And how will the answer, when it is communicated, uh, also be communicated to the wider public? Yeah, thank you very much. That's a good day. Um, I don't know who's best to answer that, whether it's uh, Andy Williams or um, uh, anyone from the, the team who might give us an answer on that. Or Mark, perhaps. Oh. Chair, sure, I am here. Perhaps you could clarify for me what specific question is. I'm sorry, I'm not uh, no, quite, quite on the right page, I don't think, this with this. Was, what, this what was, information was... It was about hydrotherapy. Been... It was a whole range of questions about hydrotherapy. Okay. Um, and the, the hydrotherapy pool being, obviously, uh, how is it currently staffed? How many patients? So the answer was, you gave me, was that uh, you get a full response by the 16th, which is Wednesday. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't have a further update at this point, but um, uh, I can only refer to that answer. And I take I note the councillor's comments, but I, I don't have any further information at this point. I'm sorry, Chair. Yeah, OK. And I think the other part of her question, which is very relevant, is how will it be communicated? I mean, obviously communicate to um, to to the communicate back to Ewan, that he can make sure it gets spread, um, uh, certainly amongst the obviously members of the committee. Uh, but also um, we'd have to look at a way of making sure that that gets out to those that are obviously now joining us on social media. Quite how that yes, happened. We'll, um, but that's we a magic trick. try to share uh, answers to questions that have been put to us through the consultation website and consultation media right. through frequently asked questions, that sort of thing. So That'll as be. well as communicating directly yeah. to you, we'll make sure that's uploaded to um, to the relevant website. And um, uh, changes, that if, if there are detailed changes that affect particular individuals, then um, we uh, invariably contact them directly if they're affected by service change. But the generality of it will um, put to our, our kind of general communications and through the website. Yeah. yeah. Th thanks very much, Andy. I think that's fair enough. Um, at least that one I think will be into. And I understand uh, that that's all we are on, on those questions. Um, uh, item four is urgent items. I've not been notified of anything urgent of what we've got. It's all urgent. Um, declarations of interest. Do any members have a, a, an interest in anything they wish to declare? No, I see no no, no hands waving. Uh, the item six is presentation of petitions. And I have received petitions, but as they're all in relation to St Mary's Birthing Centre, I'm going to take them under item seven, which is the next item. Um, and we'll wait until after the presentation by the officers, and then we'll actually have the, the, the one petition that I've been asked to present it um, is from uh, Helen Cliff. Uh, we'll do that straight after the, the uh, presentations by, presentation by the officers. Um, so moving on to item seven, which is the UHL Acute and Maternity Reconfiguration Consultant Consultation called Building Better Hospitals. And as I mentioned, before we actually start it, just so people are aware, I think we, because we've had so many supplementary questions, I think it, what I'd like to do is take those now, because that way we can actually get um, it linked in and officers can start looking at obviously what we're going to be discussing for the next period of time. Um, and the only other thing I want to point out also is that when um, Councillor Kittrick and I had a, a pre-briefing last week, um, we thought the suggestion was that we try to break uh, this part of the meeting into themes. And the four themes that we picked out, uh, officers picked out in order to try and make it easier. And if we can give it a time scale, let's say 20, 25 minutes each bit, um, just to try and give it a bit of, bit of, of, of order. So number one is publicising the consultation and distribution of leaflets. A lot of questions about that. Uh, number two, maternity services and the general hospital. Number three is bed numbers and capacity. And number four is car parking, transportation, environmental accessibility type issues. Um, I'll repeat them 
perhaps before we actually start on the actual but, but those are the main themes if we can try and if we keep each one to about 25 minutes we might all finish this meeting um in a reasonable time as opposed to going on all night um that's what i'm trying to do so i'd like to invite now the supplementaries so people can start thinking about them and we have to get the answers um glenn cartwright are you on the line No. Right. I know this lady is Jean Burbage. Hello. 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 Yes. Um, well, I uh, thank the CCGs for giving a lot of information back about the leaflet delivery. But I'd just like to follow it up because a few bits of my queries weren't answered. What do you mean by the statement that sodas delivery is not an exact science? Surely the company either did or did not deliver those leaflets. So I, I did ask what percentage were GPS tracked. So and how much of the CCGs paid for this sodas delivery? And what compensation will they seek for partial performance from that company? Thank you. Very much. Um, Officers, if you want to um, take note of these, I think the easiest way is so that while the other questions get asked, and they'll ask you to then uh, either include them in your presentation or directly answer them if, if there's something that's not in the presentation, if that makes sense to you all, just to try and keep it moving along if I can. Yeah, that's fine. Is that okay. Um, next one I've got is Juliana Foster. Yes, hello, good morning. Can you hello. hear me? Yes. Right. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, my supplementary is um, the, the PCBC repeatedly states that the hospital plans are premised on new models of care and extra work being done in the in community settings. Please, can you tell me whether this extra care has been quantified and costed? Right. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. That's noted. Um, <coughs> I don't think I've seen this name on, on the list that I see in front of me. Lorraine Silcock. Lorraine Silcock? Nay. Uh, Kathy Reynolds. Nay. This one is definitely yes. there. Hello? Hello, Kathy Reynolds here. Hello, are you going to ask your supplementary? Yes, we're grateful to the chairman for his assurance that scrutiny will continue to review neurorehabilitation. However, we are concerned that the reply does not give a clear indication as to where and when this essential service will be resurrected in a suitable facility following the closure of Wakerley Lodge. Yep. Yep. When will we see firm plans and specific details on this in UHL's planning? The temporary arrangements have already been in place for too long. Thank you. OK, thank, thanks very much, Cathy. Um, I mean, while I'll, I'll let them respond in, in due course, but just to point out that uh, the health and scrutiny will all be we're reviewing all of the comments, obviously, but we'll also be reviewing particularly um, that service. And we'll put it into our future work programme anyway. Uh, just a, a bit of reassurance, I think, if I can leave it at that. Um, next person is Liz Warren. I know you're there. We've spoken. Hello. Yes. There you go. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, I asked question six, uh, yes. and I asked for evidence to support UHL's assertion that St Mary's Birth Centre is not cost effective, and uh, obviously the the, five, the requirement of five hundred births in a year in the new um, unit if it's set up. We didn't get any facts and figures uh, in the response. So I don't know whether that means there isn't any evidence or whether they're not prepared to give the evidence. But I would like to see the facts and figures which uh, demonstrate, uh, I'd like to see the basis of the calculations, how they arrive at the cost per birth in such a unit. And uh, comparing with the cost per birth in, in a maternity hospital, taking everything into account, uh, the extra 
uh, cost of providing expensive specialist care and medical procedures in a maternity hospital, for instance. I think we need to see everything, not just bland statements and, and assurances. OK, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, uh, Bob Waterton. Yes, I've seen you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had uh, three questions, actually, didn't I? Eight. 8A, 8B and 8C, so if I might, if I might um, ask supplementary questions focusing a bit mm. around the costs and benefits here. So on 8A, uh, the question, my supplementary question is, table 610 on pages 161, 162 of the PCBC shows an annual benefit of five million five hundred eighty nine thousand for improvements in staff motivation so is over what period is this annual amount treated as accruing in the calculations mm -hmm. <coughs> and shouldn't the benefit be expected to decline over time this is not about discounting it's that the amount mm. uh, is shown as being the same every year but you know, one might think that that might decline uh, as the new system is established, whatever that new system is. So it's not about the discounting question. It's about whether the benefits, mm -hmm. uh, that benefit, recorded benefit falls over time. On 8B, um, this question is asking about the costs of additional community care requirements. Um, that's bullet point three on page 15. Yeah. Um, the answer, also on page 15, appears to say that no account has been taken of this issue, although the wording um, makes it confusing about whether that's an answer to the question or not. But my question, therefore, is, isn't the implication of a policy of low bed numbers at the LRI over the next decade, together with the loss of community hospitals, that more of a burden will be placed on the community and that this should be incorporated into the calculations. Mm -hmm. And on 8C, yeah. um, the issue raised in this question is about the relative differences between the options and the options and business as usual. So if you cast your eye along the mm -hmm. bottom lines, there, it's, it's about the differences. So what gets included and how it's valued is crucial to the calculated outcomes. So focusing again on a particular issue, just to demonstrate what this is about, um, in this respect, therefore, I'm focusing on one included item. Is it not possible that what's called further detailed work on the multiplier, that's on par paragraph two on page 17 of the printed answers, might significantly reduce the multiplier effects over time due to the leakages from the local economic system. So it's focusing on the multiplier. This further work might actually reduce, is the question I'm asking. Obviously, it might increase it, but it might reduce it. Is that OK, Chair? Yeah, yeah. I, I, just I, last point. I mean, it does quite clearly say in my answer that the detailed work will take place in the outbound business case. Yes, it, obviously not getting it at this at this level at this stage, but it will be provided. Anyway, um, uh, have we got a Sarah Seaton on the line? Um, I am on the line. Yes, my question was about car parking and footfall. Have you reached that point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're, we're, we're going in, in, in an order. It's just the okay. order I've been given. <laughs> okay, that's that's absolutely fine. Um, it's just a brief question of clarification on the answer yep. to my question. Um, two points. Firstly, can it be clarified what's included in the figure of 23,109 increase in footfall? Yep. And um, secondly, I'm not sure that C is quite what I was asking for. Um, what I was asking for was the net reduction or net increase in footfall and traffic overall. So perhaps that can be clarified for me, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and finally, if, if you're there, Louise Wilkinson. No. OK, so that's that's the, 
the list of supplementaries. I'm sorry. Dr. Felton, I believe Lorraine Chilcock has just joined, if you want to take her question. Oh, has she? All right. Lorraine, are you there? You've got your hand up. She's got my hand up to attract attention. I'm sorry I've had trouble um, joining the meeting and apologise for being late. Um, I thank you for the answer um, to my question. Um, but um, being pandemic ready is not uh, just about more intensive care capacity and elective care capacity, although I agree they're very important and much welcomed. Um, it's also about the design of the buildings. Um, national experts, including Simon um, Corbyn, um, have said that it's important to build um, this into the design of the building to fit spaces out from the outset so they can be used for multiple functions to design certain departments next to others, um, to have more space for staff to get in and out of PPE. Um, will, the, will you modify the design um, and the plans to achieve these aspects of pandemic readiness and um, resilience? If you're sticking to the £450 million funding, as you have said, what other aspects of the proposals will be right, thanks, Lorraine. I mean, it does say in the answer that new buildings will have a more generous footprint. I appreciate that's not a very detailed answer, but it does at least indicate there is some kind of consideration for it. But anyway, um, so for those of you that didn't join right at the start of this session, the idea is that we uh, took the supplementaries now uh, so that as the uh, officers take us through their report now on their paper, um, if they can, then they can fit in the answers to your supplementaries because many of them clearly are uh, very relevant to, well, they all are, they're all relevant to what we're talking about today. So rather than just repeat it all, it's better to stick it in so that people could then answer it as they went along. Um, so uh, I, I think the next Dr. best... Felton, uh, yeah. Dr. Felton, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, Glyn Cartwright has just joined the call. Oh, has he? Right. Glyn, are you there? If he is, he's very quiet. Glyn, this is the chance you have. After this, there won't be another chance. He's left. Ah. Perhaps thought he was in the wrong meeting. It's a shame because he had, he had about three supplementary questions. Seeing as he asked 70 questions, I think there were quite a lot of information. He has been in touch with me privately. Um, so I know roughly what he was about. That's a shame. To be fair, all of the questions that he's asked, trying to rejoin again now. Oh, good. Thanks very much. Let's see if he can join. Hello. Hello, Glyn. Hello. Oh, you can hear me. Yes. Can't Sorry about that. Tremendous you, difficulties can... with my technology today. Yeah, it happens, sadly. Oh, <laughs> you're moving right. around screen. Uh, there's no visual, but we certainly have you on, on audio. Oh, well, that's, that's probably the best way. OK. <laughs> um, we just literally, I was about to end the supplementary questions because there were no others online, but you've now joined us. Uh, do you yeah. want to ask your supplementary questions? I said, I, I will be strict. If they're not supplementary to actually your question, I'll have to move you on. But anyway, okay. which, which, uh, which, 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 in, in a way, in a way, they are slightly statements. Um, but um, uh, I, I noticed that. Um, the uh, CCG is saying that uh, transfers for first-time mothers is 45%. Uh, in fact, the I believe the figure for transfer from freestanding midwifery-led units um, is, such as Melbourne, uh, Melbury, is actually 36%. So I think they've got a little bit mixed up there with the, the um, answers that they're giving. Oh, where, where, sorry, Glenn, where did you get the, where have you got that information from? 36? 36.3%. Where, where's that from? Um, that is actually from um, one of my sources of information. Yeah, right. Uh, and also that the uh, transfer figure for second, third time mothers is under 10%. <laughs> When they're saying 45%, I think they've got their figures a little bit incorrect. Right. 
Um, okay. And, and the point we're making is, well, although you asked your supplementaries, uh, what I've asked is that when officers present their report, they bear them in mind so that when they're making their report, and we're obviously the rest of the uh, committee are asking their questions, then th they will be referring effectively to your questions as well. I mean, obviously, we've, we've had uh, 11 other supplementary questions, so it, it'll feed it in rather than stop and start and keep it going different. So anyway, is that okay, your so first that's, that's a statement and that's based yeah. on information that I received yesterday, sir. Yeah, right. So uh, I couldn't have not, written, I not, could not have included it any sooner. No, but you're not telling us where you got it from. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, Dr. Sally Ruane. Thank you. Well, she's written a report, which we've had. Yep. Um, also, um, a, a small point, uh, the, the argument in the uh, maternity paper that Sally Ruane, Ruane wrote, yep. um, that a 12-month trial of a freestanding birth-led sorry, midwife-led unit um, at the General Hospital is unlikely to succeed. Well, that's a comment, but certainly uh, there's no fact behind it, is there? We don't know. We haven't got to the end of the year. Right. Um, so uh, is the CCG serious about allowing, allowing it to succeed? And are they planning to end birth centres such as St Mary's altogether? There's one in the maternity hospital planned as well. Yeah, but that's not freestanding away from a hospital. That's that's not like Melton Mowbray is. I thought Melton Mowbray was a hospital. Anyway, keep, keep going, keep going. Um, yep. Yeah. Any another one? Um, no, that'll, that'll, that'll be fine. All right. Thanks very much, Glyn. Very good. Right. So we'll now move on, as I said, um, to uh, our, um, our main paper today on building better hospitals. Uh, to prevent this item, we have uh, Andy Williams, Chief Executive of the, the three CCGs, Rebecca Brown, who is Acting Chief Executive for UHL, Mark Whiteman, I've certainly seen him, him, Director of Strategy and Communication, uh, UHL, and I think there may be others that you call as you go along. But uh, I presume, Andy, are you going to take it first? Yes, thank you, Chair. I hope you can uh, hear me okay, and thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, to talk to you all again. Um, from uh, my, my understanding, from what you said, Chair, is that I uh, and colleagues will try and address the questions we've just heard as part of our, our it, response. It, so I will try and explicitly pick them up. Um, uh, so I should say as well that whilst we're um, really happy to answer as candidly as we can, it is possible we won't have answers to all the questions straight away. And if we are unable for any reason, particularly if it's a question of detail, to kind of provide that answer here and now, then we'll do our absolute best to, to provide that answer as quickly as we can afterwards and, and communicate that to you so it's a, a matter of record. But um, so it's, it's my uh, privilege, really, to introduce this item again, really, and just to talk about where we're at. We're coming quite close to the end of the formal consultation period now, and so it's a good chance to take stock and to um, to think about how we move forward. Um, many of the members here today will understand uh, and have had an opportunity to look in some considerable detail at the proposal, so I'm not proposing to go through them in detail, but I do want to um, just take an opportunity, I think, to say a few things First of all, about the proposals, and then secondly, about the consultation process itself. Um, so in terms of the proposals, uh, I think we've previously rehearsed and, and uh, other colleagues and Rebecca and her team will no doubt reaffirm this, um, that these proposals have been a long time in the development. We have been keen for um, over a decade, really, to um, uh, rationalise the layout of acute and community uh, and maternity services. Um, and we've been keen to do that for quality reasons. And just to emphasise that, this entire suite of proposals is driven um, first and foremost by a desire to try and get the best quality of service care available. Um, and at its heart is an intention, really, to try and get um, a more rational co-location of services so that they can work in support of one another, to get a consolidation of some services so that we're able to staff and run them um, safely and appropriately and in a sustainable way, um, and to try and affect a separation between the provision of urgent and emergency care and planned and elective care so that both forms of care can operate more robustly uh, and uh, with greater efficiency. And that's 
um, uh, we'll elaborate on all of those points, but I think those are at the heart of this consultation. Um, the other thing I would like to stress, I think, is that these proposals um, stand on their own merit. I and mean, we've had a lot of conversations about um, and wanting to understand the uh, totality of proposals in the round and the relationship between these proposals and the developments of other services from community services to mental health services to primary care services. Um, and whilst that's uh, understandable and important, I think we have always been, and I continue to be very clear, that these proposals stand in their own right. This represents, in my view, and I think the view of uh, NHS colleagues generally, a very positive and constructive way to move these services forward in the interests of all of the patients in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, a couple of thoughts on the consultation process itself. Obviously, we've been running a consultation process that's different by nature. We're in the midst of a uh, of a pandemic, and, and that's obviously meant that some things we would have traditionally done, particularly perhaps large public meetings, um, simply haven't been appropriate or safe to run. Um, so we have run a, a slightly different consultation. We believe we've run and are continuing to run for at least another week or so a very positive consultation. Um, we've had uh, around 4,000 responses, which uh, we think is a very good response rate to a consultation of this sort. Um, more significantly, and perhaps um, much more significantly from my point of view, um, we've had over 90,000 distinct, unique uh, interactions with the, the website. So 90,000 people, um, and that's not a cumulative number, that's not one person going on 90,000 times, that's 90,000 separate individuals um, have uh, accessed and uh, and therefore um, had an opportunity to engage with the website and look at the detail of the proposals. And I have to say that's a number way, way higher than that which we would, um, you know, perhaps in former times have accepted as being a good coverage. We'd never have got that kind of coverage using kind of physical meetings, that sort of thing. So um, the fact that, that we've used a lot of virtual media, that we've run those kinds of processes, that we've engaged um, with social media and digital approaches, um, whilst uh, are different in some characteristics to, to kinds of processes that people will be familiar with in the past, they've worked, um, I think, exceptionally well. And um, the evidence of that is in the kind of range of responses we've had, which um, from our initial analysis, appear to be a very good geographical coverage, coverage very good um, uh, coverage in terms of the different demographies, different cultural groups, ethnicities, age ranges. Um, so it doesn't look, and we've been careful to monitor this through the process, as though we've got any kind of areas where we've um, got kind of conspicuous gaps in our coverage. And, um, and that's uh, reassuring to us because what we want to do, of course, is to get as broad a a set of feedback and concerns as we possibly can. Um, the majority of the responses uh, that we've received still indicate overall that people are either positively supportive or neutral about the, uh, the proposals that we're setting out. And that in itself is also pretty unusual. It's often the nature of uh, of consultation exercises that the most active responses come from people who've got concerns or are opposed to proposals. And so you often get quite a lot of evidence of concern being raised and, and less evidence of satisfaction. Um, and usually for us, we've actually got a preponderance of people um, broadly in support of what we're trying to achieve, um, some very actively so. There are, of course, concerns, and that's particularly true in relation to the proposed changes to the midwifery service in Melton, uh, which is the exception to that kind of rule that I've described. And we have to think very carefully about the nature of those responses. Um, and just to be clear, when the, fun when the consultation finally closes, and it, it hasn't yet closed, of course, um, the entire consultation feedback, all of it in total, will be evaluated independently and a report produced. And that will take some time because we want that to be a thorough analysis of the issues raised and that will then come back to the CCG boards um, before we move on. Um, something also about the, the nature of the process we've run, we've um, unusually included 
Um, I'm kind of slightly wondering about the wisdom of it now, but we unusually committed to a leaflet drop. That's unusual. That's very unusual. Um, uh, the difficulty, of course, is that having committed to delivering it, you then create an expectation that it will be universal. And, that, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, that is often not the case. We were asked a specific question about this. So uh, we've run that leaflet drop twice, actually. And the second drop uh, was run by the company we contracted as a compensation for the fact that concerns were raised about the coverage of the first drop. Um, uh, we have distributed more leaflets than there are households in LLR. Um, uh, and we've got, um, we, we did ask for and got um, uh, GPS tracking data for the second distribution um, to verify that the people distributing the leaflets had actually physically covered um, the geographies that we were anxious about. Um, we've also used this an independent company to either ourselves or the um, leaflet distributor to verify using a phone follow-up um, who can we call having the leaflets? And interestingly, the interest the the industry standard for this is about 60, 40 to 60 percent. So typically, when people do a leaflet drop, between about four and six people in ten can recall actually receiving it, even when it's been delivered through every letterbox. Um, partly the reason for that is that some people just pick it up and stuff it straight in the bin, don't even recognise that they've had it because you know we all get junk mail and often this is mistaken um, for just more junk mail sometimes people do get it scan it but don't kind of immediately connect it with a follow-up question or may not uh, understand it other people of course get it read it from cover to cover and, and react to it um, uh, and of course it is possible despite the fact that we've run the drop on several occasions that some households simply didn't receive it for some reason or another and although we've tried exceptionally hard to make sure that's not the case we are still getting feedback to say that people um you know are absolutely adamant they haven't received it so i believe that we've done everything we reasonably could have done including a second run of the leaflet drop where we felt that was appropriate to try and make sure that people had access and we take some reassurance i think from the fact that we've achieved levels of um, recall coverage consistent with the the kind of standards we'd expect um, and we also take i think some comfort from the fact that um, in some of the areas where we've had the greatest numbers of concerns about access to the leaflet, um, those are also the areas where we've had proportionately a greater response to the consultation. So it doesn't look as that as though that's actually inhibited people's ability to um, to engage uh, with the uh, with the uh, process. And I, you know we have been sharing that in some of the local meetings that we've we've been running. Um, so uh, overall, I think uh, we have got a, a very exciting uh, set of proposals. We remain um, really committed to communicating and explaining why we believe these are the right things to do. Um, as the meetings have gone on, I think we've had some really great questions posed and some really good um, interactions with the community. And I hope we've been able um, we certainly have tried to be very candid in our feedback. Um, we are, of course, as an NHS set of officers and, and particularly clinicians, um, uh, very positive about these changes. We believe in them. We are enthusiasts for them. We do believe genuinely this is um, a positive and uh, an important development for services in this area. Um, it's a massive inward investment. It's a very significant opportunity um, to address some of the concerns that we've been worried about in truth for uh, a decade. We're really happy to provide uh, some further answers where we can. But I'll I'll hand now to, to Rebecca just to provide a bit of an overview from UHL's position particularly. And then, um, we know, between us, we can start to address some of the more detailed issues. But um, if I pause there and perhaps just invite Rebecca to come in at this point, chair with your agreement. Hi, thank you. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, you know, Andy has really said most of what needs to be said. I think uh, just to say from, you know, the, the numbers that we've had, the 90,000, I think is very, very impressive. I think we should all be very, very proud of that and understand some of the challenges that we, we are currently facing. I think uh, the the opportunity that we are facing here is so, so exciting and something that we should all be getting behind, understanding that we need to make sure that we uh, that we explore and understand the issues and concerns that people have. 
So, you know, I, I, I haven't really got anything else to add, but I think it would probably be worth just probably bringing in some of the team, particularly around uh, some of the questions that are raised. So I think if I if I could bring in Ian and Flo to start, I think that would be really happy. I think we've sort of discussed really the, the letter drop. So if we could sort of bring in the... Um, the conversation around um, St Mary's, that would be really helpful, uh, please, Ian and Flo. So, um, hello, uh, councillors. I'm Ian Scudamore. I'm a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist, and I'm clinical director for Women's and Children's Services at UHL. Um, I've been working at uh, the Leicester Hospital since 1996 as a consultant, yeah, the beginning of, yeah, the, the 1996 as a consultant. Um, and uh, tiny bit, just tiny, tiny. Of, I'm getting quite a lot of noise. So, sorry. It's not long. Chair, Chair, I think you're not on mute. Yeah, okay. I, so I've, I've been working at Leicester's Hospital since 1996 and um, we've been working on, on proposals to try and make the services sustainable for the long term for quite a long time, which I'll go, go into with you. I think I think St Mary's obviously has been raised. There are two or three things there were uh, in, the, in the supplementary questions that I just heard. Uh, there was a question from Elizabeth Warren about the cost of providing care in St Mary's. And there were some comments from Glenn Cartwright about uh, the transfer rates and um, and, and uh, uh, running a unit uh, at the, G the LGH site, a standalone midwifery unit at the LGH site. And I can address those, but I think it would be appropriate just to give you a little bit of context first, uh, because I think that's very important. Um, the, at the moment, we run our services across two sites. So, uh, well, three, four sites effectively. Um, all our antenatal care is either provided in the community for mums who don't have particularly complicated pregnancies, or alternatively is provided through a combination of community and hospital clinics for those that do have more complicated pregnancies. Uh, what we call intrapartum care or care for delivery is provided in, in four different locations effectively or four different options. The first is, is an obstetric, what's called an obstetric unit, which is serve, serviced by a combination of obstetricians, midwives, anaesthetists and neonatologists. Um, and we have two of those, one at the Royal and one at the General. The second is uh, a midwifery uh, provided uh, birth centre alongside the obstetric unit. And we have two of those, one at the Royal and one at the General. And they're staffed by midwives, but only doctors, um, but are next door to the obstetric unit in the same building, which means that uh, there's ready transfer um, to the obstetric unit should the, the labour become complicated or there be any problems that mean that mum needs uh, support and attendance by medical staff uh, or indeed the, the baby. Um, the, the third option is the standalone birth centre, which is up at St Mary's, and that's a birth centre which is um, freestanding and uh, is run by midwives up at St Mary's. Um, and uh, at the moment is the only option in Leicester and Leicestershire for women to have their babies in a low risk environment in the community um, uh, away from the main uh, maternity units, unless they want to take the fourth option, which is to have their baby at home. Now, for, for practical purposes in terms of safety and clinical, clinical support, having your baby at home is the same as having your baby in a freestanding um, midwifery unit. Um, th there isn't any difference, and that's well recognised in the birthplace study. There is, of course, in terms of um, issues such as uh, not wanting to have children around in the house at the time that the baby's born um, and, and being in, in an environment away from home, if, if that's what women do want. Um, but actually, the ability to provide clinical support is just exactly the same. There are no doctors. Um, there's no other medical support. It's completely reliant on midwives and uh, being able to provide the care that's necessary. And they can do that at home in the same way as they can in a freestanding midwifery birthing unit. <clears throat> and of course, if there are complications or problems in labour, then it's very Im important that women understand that they will need transfer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where um, Glyn's question comes in. 
the best available information on big numbers is that about 40% of women in their first pregnancy and first labour would need transfer from a freestanding birthing unit or from home into the hospital. And it is absolutely the case that if transfer does need to happen, that results in delays and the, what we call the morbidity or the potential for a poorer outcome for the baby and the mother is higher if they require transfer. And it is very important information that the woman is given um, in order to help her make her decisions. And actually is one of the fundamental issues that is reported initially in the interim report from, the, from um, uh, Ockenden uh, with, in, in regard to Shrewsbury and Telford. So it, it is the case that the best available information on the best numbers is that it, for first time mums, about 40% of women, women will, will require transfer in labour and for second and subsequent pregnancies, around 10% will need transfer in labour. So that, that's the model we have at the moment. The proposed model going forward, uh, oh, the, the other issue is that our postnatal care at the moment is, is in the main provided in the community. So women do stay in hospital if they need to. They'll stay in hospital for a period of time after the baby's born. If everything's straightforward and normal, that may be a few hours or it may be overnight. Flo can expand on that a little as, as, as she feels is appropriate. But if there are any medical reasons for women to be in hospital or if their baby needs care, then they will stay in hospital in postnatal beds. Um, and that's not something that's proposed to change at all in the model going forward. The model that we're proposing going forward is to um, combine the obstetric unit and the alongside birth centre on one site. And the reason we need to do that is that at the moment, it's uh, there are two main reasons. The first is at the moment, um, one or either site is very vulnerable um, uh, a significant amount of the time. Now, we do maintain safety of the two services, but there are times when it is very difficult, and that's becoming increasingly difficult. It's largely related to staffing, um, but it's also related to the acuity and the complexity of women. We have um, a, a lot more women with uh, a lot of other comorbidities who are pregnant these days, um, particularly uh, women with obesity, for example, and other medical illnesses such as diabetes, who do add considerable workload and considerable risk to the services that we provide. And it's not possible for us to, um, uh, to centralise that activity on one site at the LRI, for example, because there just isn't the space and the, the acuity in that environment would be too high. So it is very difficult for us to maintain services across the two sites and maintain safety. The second issue is that there's a lot of a lot of duplication um, and, and that duplication extends to the other clinic, acute clinical services that are necessary to support um, a unit of the size of LGH and to support a unit of the size of the Royal Infirmary. And for, for the broader, wider reasons with regard to the reconfiguration, a number of those acute services are going to need to be moved off the LGH site and moved to Glenfield or the Royal. In those circumstances, it is absolutely not safe and it is absolutely not sustainable to run a large maternity unit uh, at, the, at the Leicester General. And therefore, um, it, it, it is the case that it needs to be co-located at the Royal Infirmary. We've had three separate reviews since I've been in Leicester. The first in the early noughties, the second uh, 2008-09, and the third um, in 2015-16, um, to look at the sustainability of maternity services going forward, looking at a number of different options um, that, that may be considered. All of those, all three of those, have recommended that we need to co-locate services to maintain safety and quality for the long term, and that co-location needs to be at the Royal. So the plan, therefore, is to have the obstetric unit at the Royal Infirmary with a, a very large alongside birth centre. Secondly, um, to make sure that women have the option of all four choices and that, and, and that there should be a standalone birth centre for those women that would like to have one. And thirdly, to provide home, home births, and, and we're committed to supporting home births in a way that Flo, I think, will, will describe to you. Um, in, in the context of where we should have an along, a, a standalone birth centre, what we need, it is absolutely the case that standalone birth centres um, 
uh, have costs that are proportionate to the activity. You have to provide the estate, you have to provide a certain level of staffing. And unless you are doing something around 450, 500 deliveries a year, it is, it is expensive to be running a standalone birth centre. At the moment, um, the, the St Mary's birth centre is not um, available to a very large proportion of, of women in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. And, uh, and at the moment is running at around about 150 deliveries a year. And essentially that's because it's eccentrically positioned, ex, 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 you know, it's up in the northeastern part of the county. And what we think is that if we're going to be able to provide um, a standalone birth centre option for women in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland, um, in, a, in a way which is equitable and is liable to be long term um, sustainable, then it needs to be in a more central location. And the LGH site is a sensible and appropriate one um, it, to do that. Now, the expectation would be that we would be developing that service in a very positive way in the context of the maternity transformation program that, uh, and, and better births that, that, uh, that we're pursuing as a national program that we'd be working to develop a, a really exciting uh, midwifery based uh, service across uh, the whole system from home birth through the standalone birth centre to the alongside birth centres. Um, and that we would be um, uh, hoping and expecting that we would have probably perhaps 300, 350 um, women delivering in that first 12 months. Um, and we wouldn't be expecting to slam the doors closed at, at 12 months. Uh, th that, that is not how you would expect to run a pilot. Um, and, and what we would expect is that if, if there appears to be um, sufficient interest in the, in the community of Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland, then that would be sustainable for the longer term. And it absolutely would be a commitment that, that, that the uh, services would be making. So I, th I think that gives you uh, a, a flavour, I hope, for, for where we're at, what we've been through, um, why we've come up with the, the proposals uh, that, that we have. And I hope has answered a couple of the questions in so far as making it clear that uh, I do think um, Glyn's, Glyn's comments are perfectly reasonable um, and a 40% transfer rate for non and a 10% for women that have had babies before is the best nationally available data and is consistent with the numbers actually that he gave you, that we wouldn't be expecting to slam the doors at 12 months, but we would have to be convinced, I think, that there would be, that there is a, is a reasonable appetite for a centre at LGH and that the cost of providing care at St Mary's unfortunately are disproportionate because it's only doing 150 deliveries a year. And that relates to the, the fixed costs of staffing and the fixed costs of having the buildings and the estate um, that, that you can't do anything about. Uh, and and uh, until we get to a certain level of activity, it means that it's an expensive service to provide. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, Andy, was there anyone else you want to bring on? Yeah, I just wonder, it might be, um, I, I think Flo is uh, is online with us as well. Yes. It's uh, one of the kind of key midwives. In fact, she's uh, got a bit of a starring role in the video that many people may have seen. So it might be nice just to hear a little bit about uh, from, from Flo and then um, perhaps we can lead into some of the other questions or key areas. So perhaps uh, if, if Flo is able to join us, that would be great. Hello everyone, my name's Flo Cox, I'm the Community Midwifery Matron, so I look after all the community midwives in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland, and I also manage the birth centre at St Mary's. Um, I'd agree with everything that Ian said about the birth centre, because basically the um, facilities are like a home birth away from home, and that means that women don't actually book to go to St Mary's until four weeks before their due date. So at 36 weeks, we go, they go to the unit, have a look around, and we do an intention to birth form. And unfortunately, at, even at that stage, women decide that it's an option that they no longer feel is appropriate for them because of the transfer time, if anything was to go wrong. As Ian said, you know, the rates are quite high for a first time pregnancy, up to 40 percent. It is less for subsequent pregnancies for women who have given birth naturally before. And women transfer for a number of reasons. It can be something as simple as pain relief. We give all the 
low tech stuff at St. Mary's. So you can have aromatherapy, you can use the birthing pool, you can use Entonauts. But, you know, some first time mothers think that that's all they'll need, but then request an epidural. If the labour is too long, then they, you know, they may need hormones to make their labour shorter to protect themselves and their babies. So, again, that's a risk. When the baby's born, the baby might be born um, cold and or it might require resuscitation. And there are all reasons why women basically say, it's great, I might come here and convalesce, but I don't think I'll risk coming here for my birth. And as Ian said, the cost in keeping a birth centre open is very dependent on how many people use it. So as an example, last week I went there on Monday and there was one woman on the postnatal ward. There was no one in labour, one woman on the ward. It's an eight bedded ward and there were three midwives, five students and a support worker. And from a manager's point of view, those midwives could have been out supporting women in the community at home with breastfeeding or any babies that they were concerned with, the jaundice and things like that. So it's not that we don't like the model. We love the model. It's great. We want women to be able to have all four choices. So to deliver at home, to have a standalone birth centre, to have alongside birth centres and to have the obstetric care. And the beauty of the um, unit at the general is it's brand new. So, you know, it's great for us. It's a bit like a child at Christmas having the Argos book. You know, from a midwife's point of view, we can have all the stuff that we need. So we can have a birth pool in every room, which we haven't got available at the moment, because we know that's what a lot of women want for today. Um, we've got aromatherapy services and things like that. But it's the fact that the transfer time will be so much shorter. So it will be safer. Basically, things have changed. I've been a midwife here in Leicester since 1987. So I've had a very long career. You know, I've seen us. I've always looked after low risk women. But as Ian said, older women are having babies now. Women with diabetes are having babies now. Our population has changed. We actually have 52 percent of our population is black, Asian or, you know, from ethnic minorities. Those women tend to live in the city. And when we're looking at things like figures for women that give birth without medical assistance, they're all based in the city. And a lot of that is language issues they don't understand, you know, when to come in. They don't understand how to seek help. So certainly having a birth centre in an accessible area for those women will hopefully reduce that risk of women delivering on their own. Um, so we are passionate about providing this care for people because we know it's brilliant. It's a lovely model if everything is low risk and normal. But we have to acknowledge that there are women for whom childbirth is still a risky business we're sort of sanitized from it now because we don't see maternal deaths that often we don't see you know baby deaths that often but they do occur and we would be remiss if we didn't tell women that in the antenatal period so that's what we do um so moving forward we think it's you know a positive thing but we're listening to everyone we've learned so much from the public consultation because people have told us things that really we wouldn't think of which is great which is why we've got things like the maternity voices partnership because it's actually patients who are using the service that we listen to um i can't think i've missed anything off here i don't think so flo thank you no? that's really helpful and uh, thank and you Great to get a chance to hear from you directly. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, you. Chair, I'm conscious there were a few other questions raised. Would you like me to kind of suggest to bring a couple of other colleagues in just to, yeah. to address those? There were some very specific things. So I think um, Mark Whiteman might be able to talk a bit about the neuro rehab. I think that came up as a specific question. Yeah. I don't know, Mark, whether you're able to kind of come in and pick that question up. Yeah, with pleasure. and. Um, Good morning, colleagues, and good morning, councillors and members of the public. So the neuro rehab um, facility is currently at the Leicester General Hospital. It's camping out essentially in a um, in a, an old medical ward because the place it was originally sited, a place called Wakeley Lodge, the building was essentially condemnable in terms of its infrastructure. The roof leaked, the windows leaked, and it was going to cost a thick end of 250000 to replace it. Um, it's a fantastic unit. Um, the patients love it. The staff love working with the patients, but actually it's not in a fit for purpose environment. So as part of the reconfiguration, the plan is 
to move it to uh, somewhere it's sustainable and can do its work in, in appropriate um, surroundings. Kathy Reynolds, I think you asked the question. And, and just so you know, Kathy, I've been in contact with one of your old colleagues, Bart Hillier, around this um, in recent weeks to say our original intent was to site the neuro rehab unit at the Leicester Royal Infirmary. But more recently, the clinical teams have also thought about maybe it would be better at the Glenfield. And the reason they think it might be better at the Glenfield is that actually it's got more access to garden space at the Glenfield. And that's really important in rehabilitation, obviously, and special, especially neuro rehabilitation. So we're currently working with the clinical teams and some of their patient cohorts to see what the options are, whether Royal or Glenfield is better for it. Um, I won't express a preference, but I, 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 I do think I know what is best, but we'll see what, what, what comes out through the, um, the consultation and through the clinical teams. So, um, yeah, we're absolutely um, on it in terms of it needs to move. It's been camping out for too long. Um, the clinical team are up for the move and um, we'll be back to you when, once we've made a decision on where we think it is best cited. In terms of when that will happen, it will probably be sometime in 2024, bearing in mind this whole reconfiguration is a um, is broadly from the, 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 the start of the firing gun going, which is we're not ready for yet because we're still in consultation, is about a seven year programme. So it's not going to be a quick fix, but it will be a good fix when it's done. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, Chair, I know we've been talking for a little while now and I can see uh, a colleague hand raised. I, I could address some further issues, but would you like me to pause for a moment and, and hand back yeah. to you? And Yeah, yeah. G give you all time to um, get, get, get back, back and balance again. Uh, question at the moment from Ted. Ted, have you got a question on what we've just been talking about? Uh, please. Uh, I've taken part in the, um, the the consultations that have been offered, the um, the webinars, uh, particularly one that was held last Monday evening. Uh, many of the um, the health professionals that are online today uh, led a one and a half hour consultation last week, and. Um, I was very impressed with their level of leadership and organisation. Now, from a scrutineering point of point of view, <coughs> I uh, I've, I've read carefully the <coughs> excuse me the objections that have been made regarding the midwifery services, and um, I'd written something in my notes that I think I'd really wanted to um, wanted the the objectors to to really to concentrate their minds on and I would urge them to do this in the the final days of the consultation which there's seven days left so you've got this week and the weekend. Uh, the comment I came up with, surely the onus is now on the people who are objecting to the maternity plans to provide their comprehensive plan in order that it can be compared. Now, it does have to be said that um, Dr. Ruan has written, along with a colleague, uh, a 20 page paper. So the, the, the question is, is. Will the idea that the two people that have written the report beginning on page 47. Will that go to this independent assessor that's looking at all of the comments that will have been fed in to the consultation? Will they be looking at this? How will they judge that? Will they form an opinion or will it be yourselves that form the opinion and, and have to provide a response on this? Or will it be the independent people that will look at your plans versus these plans? And as I say, any plans that do come forward this week. Or will it be yourselves? 
Uh, that's the question. The point I would like to make, and I did make this point uh, last Monday, is that I am hugely impressed with the professionalism and the expertise to, to think that we've got a midwife that's been working since 1987 and a consultant that's been working since 1996 who knows so much more than probably all of us put together we 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 have to be uh, very grateful for their expertise and the care and sympathy that they've put together in this consultation so i would like to state on record my thanks to to andy williams mark the consultant ian scudamore the matron rebecca and all of their health colleagues that have worked so hard with this um but in order for us to be transparent and to be as equitable as possible, that, that question regarding this paper, the, the one that has provided an alternative pathway, how will that be uh, efficiently and fairly dealt with? Okay. Thanks, Ted. Uh, who wants to answer that then? So perhaps I can just come in on that, Chair. I think um, uh, just to clarify the the, um, the way in which this next phase of the process works. So um, in, in consultation, what we're checking for, I suppose, is to say um, uh, uh, we're minded to proceed like this. Um, how does that impact on people? Have we um, uh, thought about all of the consequences? Have we taken the actions we could to mitigate any negative impact? Um, are there alternatives we perhaps have just missed? Um, the, uh, the purpose of taking all of the feedback into the independent review is to basically organise it and to make sure that it is equitably analysed and fed back. That review process isn't um, an appeal, if you like, in the sense that they won't then overturn our decision making. Those decisions revert back to the NHS family and to the CCGs, particularly as the consultating as a consulting body, um, but but the information the reports contain, the views that have expressed, absolutely will be considered. They're all part of our process for checking, really, that um, we're not making a, a fundamental mistake, and or that we've properly taken into account the, the views of of the community. Um, it's often difficult to can kind of convey succinctly. The, the difference between consultation and engagement and, and referendum, if you like. Um, we're not looking here to see whether or not we've got a majority support for these proposals. We are looking to see whether or not, in light of the comments we've received, we need to revise our thinking. Um, uh, but, but absolutely, all of the information we've received, whether it's uh, for or against the proposals, whether it sets out alternative actions, all of it will go into the mix and be actively considered. And it is part of a process for us to make sure that um, we, uh, we proceed only in light of an awareness of everyone's comments. And um, there will be modifications. There always are at this stage of a process. Um, sometimes only in the detail, but there are always modifications or clarifications that come from the consultation. So I've no doubt that will be the case in this instance as well. I hope that's um, helpful, Chair, just to address that particular point. No, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, I did say at the start we were trying to keep themes. And so far, we're sort of sticking to it. Um, uh, Councillor, Mrs Hack. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I just have a couple of points. First, on the uh, Melton birthing unit. Um, first of all, I think one of the things that I mean, I've done I've done a little bit of work, a bit of research, and and um, the freestanding unit at Melton is the only freestanding unit we have in the East Midlands, and actually we're quite poorly served for freestanding maternity facilities in the East Midlands. The other regions have far more. Um, so is that do you think that's a factor in terms of people electing to go to a freestanding unit it's just because they're not actually that commonly available in the east midlands um i just thought that that was that was interesting um the the point though i wanted to to 
question I wanted to raise is within the documentation, we talk um, at point, 50, point 47, although the numbering's a bit strange because um, point 42 is after point 47. Um, on page 26, we talk about the transfer rates from um, Melton into uh, other birthing facilities um, being 45%. There are some sort of queries with the numbers, um, but then also it identifies that the proposal also aims to improve community based services with antenatal, postnatal and breastfeeding support. And I'm I'm sort of a little bit concerned about this because obviously there has been a retraction of breastfeeding support within the communities since we had the closures of um, many of the um, the Shore Start centres. So how are we going to resolve that circle? Because I think my real concern is that we have a community facility that at the moment is obviously midwife led in terms of home births but what comes next in terms of ongoing breastfeeding support particularly as as research tells us that women drop off from best breastfeeding at, at 16 to 20 hours after labor that's when breastfeeding in terms of attempts stop that's that's the common time frame so i think my real question is about how do we square the circle in terms of community support around um uh, ladies in in our communities but also freestanding birth units my real concern would be is that the the leicester general hospital if we transfer the service and we only give it 12 months it's not a brand new shiny facility um how are we going to get to 500 to keep that open and also there was a reference somewhere about if we decide to close it after 12 months what consultation will take place at that point thank you I think uh, I think at least the first part of that question is is uh, definitely more flows territory than mine. I think um, I might talk a little bit about the latter point around further consultation and and process after that. But I think um, flows definitely the right person to um, no, sounds the right to, one. to bring in on the first part of that uh, question from Mrs. Hack. Yeah. Hello, Mrs. Hack. Thank you for your questions. Um, quite a list there. So I'll start at the first one. Um, you're right in saying that um, St. Mary's is the only standalone birth centre in the East Midlands. And the reason for that is because of the numbers. Basically, a lot of the um, birth centres were set out in the county. I worked at one, Round Hills, which is where I was actually born. And it closed in 1990 and all the birth centres closed at that time. And sadly, it was because women were choosing not to use them because of the reasons that I said earlier about transfer rates and, you know, their concerns. So St Mary's is there. It isn't used as much as we'd like it to be used. And that's purely because of where it is. It's just the distance. There are actually 1800 women in that area that are pregnant. And they choose to go to the Royal, the General, Nottingham and Peterborough. They don't use the birth centre, even though it's there on the doorstep. And that's purely because of the risk factors, because a lot of them end up worrying that they may be transferred. So they don't go or they're not suitable to go there in the first place. Now, midwifery is changing. We're talking about something that's four years away. But at the moment, we're doing a lot of work about the Better Birth Review, which was done by the government and the NHS 10 year plan. And the reason we're doing all the all these initiatives is basically to reduce um, stillbirth rates and rates of babies with severe brain damage. And the consultation was actually performed with women. So it's about women's choices. So we're responding to what women have told us they want. And one of those things is that we're going to look at continuity of carer. So we have three continuity of um, carer teams at the moment. And by 2022, we hope we're going to have many more. Now, basically, the reason women ask for the same midwife to look after them antenatally in labour and postnatally is because it breaks down barriers. So the midwife becomes your friend. So we're hoping that's going to affect things like the breastfeeding rate. They're going to be much smaller teams. So women aren't going to be telling their story to, you know, two, three, four midwives. They're going to tell their story to two midwives. So they're really going to get to know them. They're going to be supported by maternity support workers who will be specifically trained to give support on breastfeeding in the women's home. Because it's all well and good being in a unit, but you need to be able to adapt to how you're going to be in your own environment with the resources around you that you need. So that's one way that we're going to address it. So 
um, as I say, the birth centre, what we're, we're moving away from is staffing buildings. We're going to be staffing the women. So when the women go into labour, they're going to call their known midwife. Their known midwife will go with them and they'll have a buddy. And we know that this reduces the risk of um, having a um, forceps delivery or having an instrumental birth. We know that it reduces the risk of um, it reduces women requesting things like epidurals for pain relief. We also know that we have better neonatal outcomes. Things like domestic violence, if women are concerned and they're scared, they're more likely to share it with somebody that they know. So we know from a child um, a child um, care point of view, we know that it supports women with safeguarding their children to keep them safe. So, you know, we're, look at, we're talking specifically about a new unit, but there are so many other things that are happening that will affect how we use those buildings in the future. And this is just one step towards where we want to go. So I hope that reassures you a bit, Mrs. Hack. Mm. Chair, can I just make, uh, it's Ian, it's good more. Can I just yes. make a comment yeah. about, the, yeah. the, uh, the, uh, about the, the paucity of standalone birth centres in the East Midlands? I mean, the, the tricky thing here is that, um, that there have been a lot of closures of, of standalone birth centres uh, all over the country. Um, significantly because of the difficulties in running um, small standalone birth centres that we've already alluded to. Um, I think we, we did quite a lot of engagement back in the late noughties when, when we did the second of those um, broad reviews that, uh, that I described to you earlier on. Um, and it was very clear from extensive public engagement at that time, stakeholder engagement, that um, women had a preference for alongside birth centres because of their perception that they uh, wouldn't have to be transferred significant distances if that was necessary. And I think there are two reasons that Melton is underused primarily. That's one, and I, and I do think it is a concern for women that uh, they, they don't want to have to be transferred significant distances in labour. Um, and the second is that it is just very difficult to get to for the bulk of the population in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, we, we are perhaps unusually by comparison, certainly to Nottingham, Derby, um, a, a lot of other centres, Sheffield, Manchester, um, we, we are committed to trying to provide that fourth option, so a standalone birth centre for women uh, if they demonstrate that there's something that they want to do long term. And in order to do that, somebody's phone's ringing, in order to do that, what, what we really want to do is to give equitable access to the vast majority of women in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, and that's why we're proposing to put a birth centre on the LGH site so that women can demonstrate that that's what they want. Um, and, and, you know, our services in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland and, U and UHL actually are at, at the top of the pile in terms of providing a low risk mid midwifery based um, intrapartum care nationally. Um, we do a bit, a bit over 20 percent of our activity in that environment. And that's that's really quite unusual nationally. So actually, we are a bit of a leader in this context. Thank you very much. Yeah. Apologies, uh, I, I just can gonna, I just come back on that, please? Yeah, I've got those yeah, uh, yeah. It was just, um, it was just on um, the 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 points that Ian was raising um, with regards to choice, and I, and I think one of the things that I'm nervous about is we close down a freestanding facility, replace it at the Leicester General, but because it's temporary, we don't commit whole heart, wholeheartedly to it. And my real worry is that in 12 months time, we go, not enough births, we're going to shut that. Actually, then that option completely disappears for people in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. And I think that, that I'm, that's what I'm really nervous about. And I just wanted to get to the crux of if it isn't successful, how are we going to provide choice to women to give birth in an alternative setting um, because the uh, the Royal Infirmary uh, I gave birth to both of my children at the Royal for personal reasons but I had that choice and what I don't want is for subsequent ladies following me not to have the choice. 
I can assure you. Can I just answer that? Go on, Ian. Just hang on a second. Two, two, two things to say. The first thing is, and, and it's important that Flo uh, does respond to this as well. Um, but, but the first thing is that um, I think it, it is really important that we are, that we recognise that if we're going to be able to provide a standalone birth centre for the long term as an option for women, it is going to have to be sustainable. If we don't do what we're talking about. I personally, it won't affect me because I'll be retired. You can see that I've been here for quite a long time and, and you know, I, I, it's not going to affect me for the long term. But I don't think that the St Mary's unit is going to be sustainable. At some point, it's not going to be able to be continued. And if we do want to maintain this as an option for women, we have to do something to make it a more sustainable option. And this is the way that we can do that. I just wanted to say, Mrs. Hack, that, you know, I think I can assure you that midwives are passionate about low risk midwifery care. The way they're trained now is completely different to the way I was trained. They're actually trained with the continuity of care and model. So that's that's the gold standard for them is for looking after women. And most midwives want to be able to look after women in a low risk setting. That's what we're trained to do. So, you know, we promote home births, we promote birth centres. And as I say, we just need a birth centre that's in the place where women will use it. And if it's more central, I'm sure midwives will promote it and I'm sure it will be used. I would be heartbroken if they didn't. The reason that Ian said that we had, you know, one of the highest birth rate numbers for a, a birth centre and alongside birth centre is because in Leicester we use an opt out as opposed to an opt in. I used to manage the birth centres at the Royal and the General. And basically, if you're low risk, unless you said, I want an epidural or I want to have continuous monitoring in labour, you went to the birth centre, which is specifically for low risk women where they're looked after by midwives only. And then the, the difference with that is if there's a problem, they pull a buzzer and 30 people rush in the room. Or if they decide they want an epidural, they literally move down the corridor. Whereas, you know, a standalone birth centre, obviously, you're going to have that time delay and moving it because you keep saying closing it. We're not closing it. We're moving it so that more people will be able to use it. So we're moving it to a location where it's more accessible to get to consultant neonatologists and obstetricians if people need it. But certainly I'm delaying my retirement because I want to see it through because I'm passionate about the care we give to the women in Leicester. And I know that all the youngsters that are coming behind me feel exactly the same. Thank you. Thank you, Flo. I, I, just a point I was going to raise anyway, um, before I let other people ask questions. Um, <coughs> uh, one of the advantages I was told of St Mary's, particularly for post-care, is that if you're having trouble, for example, getting your baby to feed, uh, breastfeed, that you just press a button and someone's there instantly. Um, whereas uh, at the other sites, at the Royal or at home, of course, you've not got somebody there. When the baby squeaks, you can't just press the button and someone comes, you have to wait. And at that point, the baby's gone off to do something else. Uh, just interesting how that would work. Presumably at the birthing unit at the general, it would be fine. It would work the same. It would. Um, we're not going to have postnatal bed facility, but certainly women can stay for up to 24 hours after they've given birth. But as I was saying, with women, a lot of it is about education. It's about preparation. And if you're having that one to one care with your midwife who knows you and she talked about breastfeeding, then hopefully you're not going to have those problems postnatally. Okay. And we're going to have support workers which will visit women in their homes. Yes. Right. OK, thanks very much. Uh, Melissa, you're next on my list. Um, morning, everyone. And um, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't I don't know if I should should say, but I will say that it's really, um, really refreshing flow to hear from a, a, a woman about these <laughs> these issues, which predominantly <laughs> affect women. That's the first time since I since we've been talking about this, this stuff that that's happened. So thank you. Um, it's a slight aside, um, but um, I th it's just it was it was kind of the tone really and so just gonna bring it up um but after you know after nearly 10 months of uh of pregnancy Ian I was definitely obese when I went into labour and 
I think we need to be really careful about our language when we're talking about this stuff. Um, you know, the, 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 we are seeing some systemic and huge seismic societal shifts in kind of the age and size um, in which women are, are pregnant. And But my opinion is that these are our risks and we share them. We share that collective uh, burden for all of our population health. And we don't blame individuals <laughs> for increasing our workloads, or so I'd like to think. Anyway, look, um, I've got two uh, quick points on this. And the, the first one is I think we get on a little bit lost, perhaps between the difference between the risks. And we're talking, you know, in a very risk averse way this morning um, and about choices and options, which are far more positive. And I think we're at risk of, of muddling those. Clearly, it's very emotive stuff for all of us, um, you know, but I, I'd really like us to be talking in a way that was focused on outcomes for women and the excellent feedback that I know so many um, people have, have given and shared with me about um about St Mary's um please <laughs> um so my question chair you'll be pleased to know is um that I've received really positive feedback both about St Mary's but also about um about the new the newer home birthing teams and that model and how that's working for women and I guess um the development of that provision um might have had and might have contributed perhaps to a decline in the numbers of women opting for a standalone birth unit. Is there a risk? Um, is, is that is that the case? Um, and is there a, um, a risk of us for some reason, for example, increased austerity cuts in the future changes to how we work of changing that home home birthing option, which would then leave women without those lower intervention kind of kind of options or is there a way of us now getting some sort of assurances that that kind of home birthing support will continue into the future please i'll just unmute myself hello melissa thank you for your comments um obviously the home birth team is again something i'm really passionate about and you're right it does work really well we found that in the pandemic the national um rate for home birth is something like two percent it struggles to get to two percent um, and certainly in Leicester, it joined the pandemic at the very beginning because women were fearful about coming into a place that they thought they would risk, you know, getting COVID. It went up to 7% and then it went down slightly and it's levelled off at 4%, which is fantastic. So I really hope that we maintain that. I don't think it's taken away any work from St Mary's Birth Centre um, because the figures are static, really. The home birth rate has gone up, but St Mary's has remained the same. The, at night, there's only one midwife on for St. Mary's, so they're actually supported by the home birth team. So the home birth team midwives go in there and they're the second midwife. Um, so I don't see that that's going to change, really. Um, moving forward, if we have continuity of carer, then obviously the home birth team might go in the end. It might, because basically the midwives are going to be there providing all the care for the women. So they'll also be doing home births but supported by the home birth team because they've become the experts. And the wonderful thing about the home birth team is they've taken on women who previously would not have opted for a home birth. So women that have had cesarean sections, you can't do that at St. Mary's. And that's why probably women will choose to go because it's just not safe. But in a home environment, what we do is you've got a link consultant. So the link consultant will see the woman, will do a birth plan, and the midwives go through that birth plan with the woman and there's a low tolerance for transfer. So if you've had a previous cesarean before, if there's any indication at all that there's a risk to the mum or the baby, then they transfer in. But we do offer that option to women. So women would rather choose that because they can't go to St. Mary's. So there will always be a home birth service. I can you know, guarantee that it might change. Does that answer your question, Melissa? Um, yes. And, um, um, and then this stuff, thank you. Yes, it does. The, the question, question, I guess the kind of rambly point I made <laughs> at the beginning about, um, about kind of us talking about this in a very, um, risk averse way. And I understand yeah. there's a role for that in clinical care, but also, you know, that this is, it's a bit, it's about outcomes. Surely we should be focused on outcomes and, and, and kind of how women feel that their, their care was as well. And I guess that 
that, that that we've kind of gotten lost in talking about the risk my computer's doing a really odd thing in the, in them um, in the talking about the risks posed to women rather than what women want and what women are choosing and and why and how they feel about that and and how um before during and after and I, I think we're missing a trick in in framing it the debate in that um over cautious way if that makes sense I understand where you're coming from Melissa yeah. and that is true to an extent but what I found certainly as a midwife of many years is that women just want to be listened to if you listen to them and they say you know I had a traumatic birth last time they used to come to me as birth centre manager and said I had a traumatic birth last time this this and this happened and you make a plan and you say right okay we can address this we can address that even if they still have another poor you know um not a poor outcome, but a poor experience the second time. Just the fact that you took the time and listened to them, they're very grateful for it. And it puts a completely different spin on the whole thing. And we do do that. You know, we do that on a daily basis. So, you know, that will only continue moving forward. That we do focus on outcomes and we really want women to get off to the best start, you know, with starting a family. So we'll do our best. Yeah, so Melissa, just, just very quickly, I think, uh, I mean, I... I don't think we're characterising this debate or, or conversation based on risk. Um, it, it's about choice um, and it's about making sure that women have the information they need to make their own decisions. Um, and that means they do have to understand what the potential benefits and advantages might be of any particular option that they would choose. But they also have to understand the risks involved in making those choices. And that's explicit in, in any of the investigations that have been carried out in, in um, environments where there have been poor outcomes. So, you know, the, 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 this interim report from Shrewsbury, for example, is really clear that it's about women having the information they need to make choices. And that includes being quite clear about the risks that they might be taking in, in making those choices. But it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be allowed to take those risks. That's up to them. Um, they, they, you know, they, they're the choices that they need to make. And and as, an, as a clinician, um, I, I think you would find that I am probably the least interventionist um, and, and the most likely to make sure that women are supported in making making choices, irrespective of what uh, perceived risks there might be in those choices. Mm. Yeah, Thank you, um, Gail Waller. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do feel a little bit like uh, what goes around comes around in listening to some of this this morning. Uh, I was very pleased to hear what Flo was saying about the new teams and the <coughs> supporting home births and so on. But it sounded remarkably like what I experienced when I had my one and only baby nearly 30 years ago. And um, so, you know, nothing new under the sun, which actually made me think about Melissa's point about what can we uh, say about what we're doing now in the future and actually we can't say anything we do the best we can for now and the world changes and we have to adapt to it but I think keeping the mantra of listen to the mother at the heart of it all is absolutely essential whether it is now or in 60 years time um, because whilst I had an extremely good midwife and I was planning a home birth uh, my GP didn't like it, and so he took me off his list. And I had trouble finding a GP after that because of where I lived. So, you know, I think we do have to think about stick with your mum. But my, uh, with the mum rather. But my question is is this. Um, we've had some figures uh, thrown at us this morning, like 52% of mums in the area come from ethnic minorities that we have um people, residents going to Peterborough or Nottingham to give birth and so on. And there, what I haven't got clear in my head is actually what population within a reasonable reach of Melton is of an age where they might be giving birth and might be looking at Melton mm -hmm. compared with other parts of Leicestershire, the east of Rutland, where I live, Peterborough, although it's slightly further, is actually a much shorter journey time than getting to Melton, um, uh, compared with Leicester City. And I think that's actually an important consideration. 
What's your catchment area to use school terminology? Thank you, Chairman. So in basic in basic terms, in response in response to that, um, there, as Flo indicated earlier, there are 1,800 women a year who book for pregnancy care who live in the immediate Melton postcodes, the two postcodes for Melton and all the adjoining postcodes. So those that South Nottinghamshire, um, North Central, North East and Leicestershire and Rutland. And uh, so th those are the women that you would expect would have the realistic option of being able to go to uh, St Mary's for, for their care. And of those, um, less than a sixth actually aim to have their baby at, at St Mary's and about a twelfth um, do end up having their baby at St Mary's. Um, and of course, in, in terms of the population of Leicestershire, Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland, we have just a, around 11,000 bookings a year of women um, for the whole county, a proportion of whom will have their antenatal care with us, but then will decide to go to Nottingham um, or uh, possibly Kettering or, or uh, I don't think very many would have our care with us and then go to Peterborough, um, but but some in the northwest might go to Burton. So um, we end up with about 10,000 babies being born in, in our organisation a, a year. So I think that gives you a flavour of, of, um, of what the numbers are. It means it means that if we have a, a standalone birth centre um, at the LGH site, we think that we've got a real fighting chance of um, of getting uh, you know it, it well used because what you would anticipate is that albeit it's a lot less convenient for uh, the ladies in Melton who currently go to St Mary's you'd expect that they would still want to have their baby in that sort of environment um, and and hopefully we would be able to uh, get engagement from a lot of other uh, women from um, the other parts of the county in the city and. Interestingly, I, I wasn't on the meeting the other night, but uh, I think Flo was, so maybe able to comment with with the um, I think it was the uh, Women's Muslim Association or a Muslim group who were expressing real interest in using a unit um, on the LGH site, uh, and that it wasn't something that they considered was possible for them at all up at St Mary's because it's completely inaccessible. Mm, that's interesting. Thanks. So. Um, Basically, to summarise, if I may, Chairman, you've got just under nine, uh, 2,000 potential mums for St Mary's and 9,000, have I got that right, uh, potential for the general site? Well, no, we've got 1,800 women that sort of live in all the postcodes around St Mary's and yeah. 123 so women used it. But for Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland, we deliver just under 10,000 women in total. And you'll be pleased to hear, Councillor Waller, that GPs don't strike you off their books anymore if you want a home birth. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. No, what I was meaning was your, your 1,800 is just under 2,000. If you've got 11,000 in total, Without yeah. those, you've got then about 9,000 who could go to the other. It's it's a question of, of um, trying to get a location that suits the majority is what I'm getting at there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, it, 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 it will be available for the 2,000 who in all of those postcodes. Um, and similarly, I mean, to be honest, I mean, and I'll be quite frank, frank about this, Councillor Waller, um, you know, it would be nice to have a number of birth centres. It would be nice to have one in the southwest, one in the northwest, um, and and so on around the county. But um, we did do that work back in 2009-10 as part of the review, the, the next stage review, and and it it wasn't feasible because we just didn't get enough engagement to believe that we would be able to have have enough numbers in each of those sorts of centres. Um, but it is the case, it's, it's not going to be straightforward for women from the far west of the county to come to a birth centre at the general, albeit they may still choose to do that. Um, but it is, it is a much better likelihood of far more people having equitable access to a centralised unit than there is at present with the unit up at St Mary's. Um, may I come back on that? First of all, I didn't for one minute assume that you wouldn't allow people in the Melton postcode areas to go to the general. 
And secondly, I don't think it's equitable we should be talking about because it clearly isn't equitable unless it is geographically smack bang in the centre of the LLR region. But it is more convenient for more people if it is located at the general and it is less convenient for fewer people. In other words, the reverse of what we have now. But that is not equitable. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Waller. Um, we have on a, a member of the, the, a member of our scrutiny committee is actually a member who actually is representing uh, Milt Mowbray, uh, and uh, he's online. Uh, Joe, do you want to make your point? When you've yeah, there you go. Oh, gone again. Gone again. <laughs> you're you're muted still. Yeah, there you go. Oh, it's, it's in one work as Thursday. Um, apologies for being late, but I've had my own health issues this morning and uh, just threw everything out. So um, uh, massive apologies. And a little bit of what I'm going to say, I'm sure you've heard before from uh, many of the other speakers, but as an elected member on the county council, um, there's only four county councillors, as you're well aware. I'm in the Melton area and um, I'm also on Melton Borough Council. I do represent the rural areas on basically both the uh, borough and on the county. And um, and the, there's possibly more feeling in the town about this than in, there are in the rural areas, mainly because I'm sure um, Dr Scudamore um, has already said that in the area I live, for example, most people tend to use the Nottingham hospitals, actually, because I'm a, a, you know, go to Long Clawson um, practice. And um, whereas in a town, obviously, that they're very uh, localised and very faithful to the Latham House surgery and also St Mary's. Um, just for interest, by the way, I was also born at St Mary's. My father always used to say I was born in a workhouse. Um, so I go back a long way with St Mary's. Um, I'm going to state the obvious because I'm sure, as I said earlier, um, you've heard it all before, but um, there is very, very strong feeling in Melton about the uh, the proposals, as you, you're well aware. Um, I'm aware of two petitions, I'm aware of Facebook campaigns, and you'll also be well aware of the um, motion that went to the County Council. Um, Kevin, I looked to you and Amanda about 10 days ago, wasn't it something like that? And I'm also well aware of a uh, motion that goes to Melton Borough Council next Thursday. Uh, the, the one at the County Council was unanimously supported, and obviously I voted for that, like Kevin did and Amanda. And I can say now um, I will be voting for, I'm only one member on Melton Borough Council, 28 of us, but I'll also be supporting the motion put forward by Chris Fisher and Rebecca Smedley uh, on Thursday evening. And I suppose, the, like I said, I don't really want to be going over what you've already heard, but people are just concerned that Melton's just losing yet another facility. Uh, Melton does feel as though we seem to be losing things all the time. And um, I know a lot of this, um, it, it's a frustration in, in Melton, I think. Um, it's, it's a town of 48,000, well, the area is 48,000. The town is going to be around... 25, 26,000 people like that. And we just seem to be losing things all the time. And quite rightly, as Amanda said, just when I came in, she was talking about choice. And I think this is what is the big thing in Melton. Choice seems to be being taken away all the time from Melton. And if that could be addressed within your response to the consultation that's going on. Um, I personally, by the way, was exceedingly grateful to Andy Williams, Ian Scudamore, and uh, Loretta, um, at the, we had a question and answer session with the Melton Borough Council, and I have to say you answered all the questions really thoroughly, and, but it still hasn't somehow allayed members feel in Melton Mowbray that we're still losing out, we're still losing that choice. And the campaign is just gathering strength all this time at this moment, as you're well aware, and they have until going from memory December the 21st, I think, and I suspect at Mount Borough Council on Thursday night, there's going to be a massive attendance online. I could go on and on about some people are concerned about, I've heard a, a number of stories, um, uh, ladies are concerned that their welfare is not being looked after, but I won't go into that. 
uh, because you've heard it all before. And I think Kevin told me on the chat line 11 questions already. So I don't want to re repeat everything. But the important thing for me as an elected member is to really get over to you the massive concerns that are in Melton Mowbray about this proposal. That's all I can say, Kevin. So thank you very yeah, much. Thanks, Kevin. No, again, yeah, apologies I'm for the name. Important aspect because you clearly are representing that area. Um, and uh, I mean, we were told earlier, uh, irrelevant to how many people have been on the website and made comments, uh, they've had, had already had over 4,000 responses to the consultation. So I would encourage everybody, please, if you want to say anything about this consultation, you have seven days to do it. Um, can I just, say, can I just <laughs> oh, then, I'll, then I'll relax. Um, yeah, I mean, that is important. That's what's going around, but we're quite rightly encouraging people to put in. It's a massive opportunity for people to have their say on this consultation. And yeah, I'm very, very grateful to the CCG for allowing such a long length of time for the consultation. Absolutely no one will be able to say they haven't heard about it in Melton Mowbray. No one will say they haven't had the chance to um, respond. It, it's all there. All the information is there. So thank you, CCG, for that. All right, thanks very much. Janet Underwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, for those that don't know, I'm the Chair of Health Watch Rutland, so I'm representing the voice of the Rutland people. Um, so there's sort of 40 odd thousand people in Rutland who potentially have the option to go at this moment to St Mary's in Melton. Um, I've heard the arguments on both sides, because I live between Melton Mowbray and Oakham, so I've got a foot in sort of both camps. And I've heard a lot about what people in Melton are saying and also what people in Rutland are saying. Based on that, I have to say that with all the engagement that Health Watch Rutland has been doing during this consultation period, from Rutland people alone, Health Watch has only received six comments about voluntarily offered about St Mary's. Five of those were against the move, the closure or the relocation of St Mary's. One person thought that it was um, satisfactory. But my question, are, I've got two questions actually. My first is to Mr Scudamore. He says that it's an exciting proposition. My comment to this is exciting, or my question is exciting for who? I don't think it's necessarily so exciting for the women as it is for the professionals and picking up from Melissa, possibly male professionals. And my second point actually follows on from the lady Elizabeth Warren, who asked for evidence that St Mary's was not cost effective. Um, I want to follow that a bit further. In the preamble to any of the joint HOSC papers, there's guidance for the Commission members to what questions to ask. And it says that if there is a reduction in services, we need to question the impact on those people losing out, the mitigations for those losses, what financial savings there are, the budget, risks, contingencies. Um, we're also told in the PCBC that based on St Mary's, the cost of a standalone midwife unit, uh, midwife led unit is 1.4 million. We don't get told what St Mary's is actually costing per year. So I am actually saying, should we be asking for a lot more detail on these facts from UHL and the CCG? Um, so that we can see for ourselves whether the numbers add up. Thank you. I think, Jay, you're muted. So, Jay, so, yeah. I, not again. Councillor Water was putting his thumb up for that. A lot of his questions were about costing, so I know he was uh, very much agree with that. Uh, anybody, Dean, do you want to answer? Um, yeah. Janet? I, well, um, yeah, I th look, I think notwithstanding my unfortunate gender, <laughs> I do I do have um, over 30 years experience working in in maternity and in obstetrics. Um, and for me, um, what is actually really important is that we facilitate what mums want. We make sure they have appropriate choice. 
that we don't interfere when we shouldn't interfere, mm. but we do identify, highlight problems and address them when they need to be addressed. Now, I, I think that in Leicester, Leicestershire, we're, we're, we're very, and Rutland, we're very lucky because actually we currently have a model which I think achieves most of that. Um, and the model that we are talking about having in place after this reconfiguration, I'm convinced absolutely achieves most of that, as well as, as, well as I can think of anywhere else in the country will do. What's exciting about it is that it gives us an opportunity to give our midwives and the population that they look after the opportunity to do the things that they want and to do that within the context of the National Transformation Programme, which is known as Better, Better Births, and yet to do it in a way which still allows, allows us to provide all the support for those mums that do need more intensive um, management of their pregnancy because of the complexity, if you like. I mean, I, I think the people who it's really, really exciting for are our, our, mid, our midwives and our stakeholders, the women who, who don't have complicated pregnancies. The reason that it's exciting for me in particular is because we've been wrestling with the difficulties of providing services in our current configuration for my entire career in Leicester for the past 24 years. And this gives us an opportunity to address those difficulties and yet provide all of the options that women quite rightly have re a, a reasonable expectation should be available to them. Hmm. Now, I mean, Flo might have something to add to that, but I, I do, I mean, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I can't, I can't apologize for my gender, but I can assure you that I take a, a view about the care that I provide and the care that should be provided, which I think is completely independent of that and has to be in the interests of the women. Can I just add to what Ian said? You know, better births is about choice for women. And a lot of, if you read the document, it talks about cross-boundary working. And actually it breaks my heart because I'm a community midwifery matron and we book 11,000 women and deliver 9,000. So we're providing the antenatal care for those women, providing the postnatal care for those women, but they choose to go elsewhere. So they go to all the hospitals on the periphery of our county. So, you know, that's choice. That's people choice. They choose to go there and we support them. And we provide their antenatal care, we provide the postnatal care. And moving forward with the closure of St. Mary's, what you're saying is valid. It's a fantastic service. The midwives love it, the women love it, but we want it to be available to more people. It's as simple as that. You know, I've worked in a, in, I've worked in a low risk midwifery led model since 1987. So I'm a real champion of women's choice and for low tech births. But the fact of the matter is that it's wonderful, but more people could use it. And we can't afford to have two units. If we, if we could, we would, but we can't. And it's got to be financially viable. And and I think in, that, in that context, that was the second part of, of your, your comment, uh, Janet. And, and the, the, at, at the current rate of activity at St Mary's, the cost of a delivery at St Mary's is around £4,000. And that's because we're only doing a, only 150 babies a year are being born at St Mary's. It's because it has to be staffed. It's because the infrastructure has to be provided, etc. The cost of a delivery at Leicester General and the Royal Infirmary is just about £2,000, despite the fact that it's a much more intensive environment with a lot more equipment and a lot more facility that needs to be needs to be funded. Now, it absolutely is the case that if we can get to 400, 450 deliveries in a standalone birth centre, it becomes cheaper. And it's a cheaper environment for a woman to have a baby if she's uncomplicated and has a low risk pregnancy than it is for her to have a baby in an obstetric unit. But we have to be comparing apples with apples. Mm. And basically, we talk, we, if, if you take a woman who has a, an uncomplicated pregnancy and doesn't need more intensive um, management, um, whatever you might want to call it, uh, there, then 
it, she is more expensive. It's more expensive for her to have her baby in an obstetric unit than it is in a sorry, standalone birth have, centre, sorry, provided sorry. that standalone birth centre has sufficient activity. Um, apparently, YouTube is having a problem, not us, but the, those who are watching from elsewhere. Uh, we'll just pause for a bit, please. Perhaps let's, let's have a five minute break anyway, uh, a comfort break, uh, and pop back in, in five minutes then, please. Uh, what time now? Can't even see. At, at midday, 12 o'clock. Public money on a facility that would not be realistic for the long term. So it's not about, uh, there, there seems to be a, a, a perception that there's 12 months and that's it. It's just 12 months. That, yeah. That's not that's not the, the story at all. Mm -hmm. The story is that w the intention is to have a standalone birth centre, to have that as a sustainable service for the long term. But we absolutely have to be able to take an appropriate and pragmatic review view with regard to that if it's not something that people want. If it's something they really want, then there will be yeah. sufficient numbers uh, of babies uh, born in that first 12 months for it to be ju justifiable yeah, to but, continue for a longer period of time. But, but I, I'm, I, I am not conversant with maternity units, but I am conversant with getting organisations and business and patronage up and running. And the simple fact is, is if you open something one day, yeah, 12 months is an incredibly short lead in time in order for that communication, in order for that reputation to get around. And and, and the problem, Mr. Scudamore, is, is I am somewhat sceptical about the commitment to it when you say, well, absolutely, it's 12, we absolutely have to review it after 12 months. Because that just, uh, if, if, if I were opening a cafe, yeah, I would expect that in my first 12 months, I am attracting people, I am building my reputation. And again, I do not wish to put myself in the position of somebody who is going to give birth. But I would imagine the most convincing testimonial for women to go to a birthing unit is the testimony of other, other women. And within 12 months, that reputational spread of use is, is I, I don't think that's viable. Can I just say that you keep talking about the closure of the unit? We don't see it as a closure. We see it as a continuity of the service. And therefore, the women that are booked at St. Mary's and the women that want that type of birth will still be offered that type of birth. You seem to think that it's day zero and then it's 12 months. I don't view it like that. I view it that the midwives will be selling it before it's open. They'll be telling women about the option. And also that the women that would have gone St. Mary's will go to the new unit, plus all those other women who would have chosen that as an option, but because of, you know, location, couldn't use it. So I'd just like to add that, really. Uh, and can therefore, I come in, please, why, Rebecca? Why we've thread of three years. Yeah, can, can I come in? Uh, thank you very much for your point. I think it's a really, really good point. And that's one of the points, you know, we're out for consultation for these kinds of conversations. So it's really, really healthy to have them. We absolutely want this to be a success for all of us, for all of our families to come. So I think that the scale of, of, of that review and how we review is something we can absolutely come to an agreement on. So it's not at 12 months, it's working. No, it's not. This is about a trajectory of births, making sure that we're able to work together to support, you know, getting enough births on track. Now, they may not all happen in the 12 months but they will be a, a trajectory of the births coming forward so a 12 month review like anything that we do we'll be reviewing everything that we do uh, as part of this program or, uh, at least really to just check we're doing all the right things we're you know creating the right movement we're doing the right communication you know we're getting the right group of women involved so absolutely there is commitment this is something we all want. We want it to stay. We want it to be sustainable. So we are absolutely able to look at that review process to make sure that everybody feels it is not trying to hoodwink anybody because this is not, you know, that is not what this is about. And you know, I want to be very frank about that. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Councillor, Councillor Kitterick, sorry, Councillor Felton, did you want to put forward your proposal? Because I don't think we've heard that on the webcast. He's gone. 
Sorry, I, I just sorry. I, 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 I thought it was addressed to Councillor Felton. No, <laughs> sorry, can't do it again. Let, 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 I, I've been cutting back and forth, so I, I was trying to avoid that. My my, my apologies, to her, um, and my apologies to those who I've cut into. I th I think if we can have, and it's important that this is expressed in the minutes. Yeah, yeah quite. I think if we can reach an understanding with UH on the CCG, and I'd always rather reach understanding through the consensus achieved in the minutes than by going to votes on it. <laughs> if the assurance we are being given is that the twelve months is, and sorry to be a bit technical about this, that the 12 months is merely a checkpoint at which we check on progress and see how we proceed, yeah, then I, absolutely, I think you should always review performance. If the 12 months is a point at which we decide whether the birthing unit continues, that I have an issue with, because, because in the end, with any change, and I appreciate what's been said about the continuity of service, but with any with any change, there there are quite literally birthing, teething problem problems, and it needs time to build up. So a checkpoint at twelve months, a review of progress, yes, a decision on whether it continues at that point, I have real problems about. And if if we can't get that assurance, then I will have to move to something more formal. Okay. Can I, think, I uh, can I just come in, Chair? I've been yes, having so. difficulty um, difficulty connecting, so apologies if I've been a, a bit passive in this discussion. Um, could I could I make two points, if I might, please? Um, the first is um, that uh, part of our engagement with scrutiny is to exactly get this kind of feedback, and I think if your recommendation to us is we reflect on that period and change it in the way that. Councillor Kittering has looked at, then actually I'm relatively comfortable with that, to be honest. I think I hear the point um, and, and I wouldn't have a problem with that. And I think it would certainly be better to do that than have people suspect somehow that we're not committed to these services running. And, and that talks to the second point, really, which is, and I can't quite work out when this has happened, but um, we've brought to this committee today and previously um, proposals which have got tremendous clinical engagement and support, which represent a £450 million investment in service delivery and a commitment to develop and uh, take services forward, and which have been the subject, um, notwithstanding uh, Councillor Kitterick's um, uh, cynicism, to uh, substantial levels of engagement. And, and we've done that not to prove anything, but because we're genuinely committed to improving services and taking them forward. I'm really happy to share whatever evidence we've got about the number of people that have hit the sites. And, um, you know, I understand the the, the, the scepticism. People want to see evidence. That's absolutely fine. But please don't think that somehow we're trying to agend push an agenda here, which is negative. We're not trying to make cuts. We're not trying to sneak in unpopular changes. This is a massive development. Uh, and I think it's really important just to kind of set the tone to say, um, can we focus on how we take forward this incredible opportunity, actually, um, for the area? I'm really happy to take comments about how we can improve it. But I am concerned, if I'm honest, that, that the tone of this meeting seems to have flipped at some point into a question about whether there's an integrity of purpose here. And I really don't think that's uh, appropriate or fair, if I'm absolutely honest. No, I, I, I take your point exactly. I've said to a number of people over the last few weeks, uh, this is £450 million worth of reconfiguration investment, huge potential for the for the area. Um, and it's a shame, really, that many th people are concentrating on certain aspects, and it's a shame. Um, Sam Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've just got um, one quick question, but I would like to make um, one quick comment, um, because I am slightly disappointed and I didn't come back and do a supplementary to my question because I didn't see the point when I was informed I would get the numbers by the 16th um, but I would add I first asked for these numbers on the 25th of November a briefing to Rutland councillors and I was told that I could have them within 24 hours. Obviously, I appreciate that subsequently didn't happen. Um, but then we've actually been quoted some numbers today um, that kind of speak to the numbers I was after. So I'm somewhat confused why I couldn't have, have the numbers that were relevant for Rutland. 
there was a reason I was asking for those numbers. Um, and um, notwithstanding the fantastic campaign by the um, Melton Birth Centre um, people who, who have got a brilliant campaign out there, I do feel in some parts of Rutland, some, some of our um, new mums and our mums' voices aren't being heard because they might not choose to use... Um, St Mary's um, and actually it's been really encouraging to hear from Flo because she's the first first person I've heard personally in all these debates that has actually brought the women's voice to it and the fact that you know whilst and I personally did give birth at St Mary's and, and really value the place um, I know for a lot of um, yeah, mums um, first births are scary um, and you maybe don't want to say you don't want to epidural and rule that out um, before you even begin so um, I do think I wanted these numbers to kind of look at how many of our women within Rutland um, are actually giving birth elsewhere so it would have been it was important to try and bring them in into the consultation which has been very over here very St Mary's led and hasn't given them the opportunity for voice so I'm quite disappointed in that respect anyway enough of that because obviously I'll wait for a couple of days for my numbers but I did want to clarify one thing I think it was you Flo that said it um, and it was something that when we'd had the bed um, debate a couple of weeks ago um, we, I thought these beds were moving, but then can I clarify the eight bed postnatal ward at Melton? Um, is that not moving to the new unit? And if it's not, if it's not moving, where are these eight postnatal beds going? Because that is a really valuable resource to the women of um, LLR <laughs> and actually is a, is a huge part of the service. OK, I can, I can put a bit of context. Mm. <laughs> you're muted Flo, you're muted. Hello, I can put some context on that for you. Um, basically, yes, the postnatal beds will close um, because if you look at all the models of birth centres, standalone birth centres, they don't have the postnatal facility. So moving forward, we envisage that we won't require a postnatal facility. A postnatal facility is really for mothers who have had some trauma or the babies have had some trauma and they need extra support. But in a low risk environment, we would anticipate that most women will want to be at home as they were, you know, in the pandemic. They want to get home to their families and, you know, to 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 start their new family life. And midwives will be there, as I said, to support them. We won't throw people straight out, obviously, once they've delivered. They can stay probably as a minimum of six hours and up to 24 hours, but there wouldn't be a postnatal facility as it is. And as I said, sadly, it's just not used as it, we'd like it to be used anyway. It's never full. You know, we have eight beds and we're lucky if we have 50% occupancy in any one week. So I don't think that, you know, that's going to be a problem moving forward. And the plans for the new units, there will be postnatal beds for women who need them. Yeah, thanks, Flo. Thanks. Um, Sarah Hill. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to report I did get a leaflet. It was some considerable time ago, but I remember seeing it. And I, I think that Andy um, made the point about, you know, we, we've concentrated an awful lot on one part of this. In my part of the world, everywhere's a long way away for Market Harbour. We love our own birthing centre in the district. We've got 80,000 residents, you know, and I don't... We could end up in a game of we've got more people than you, therefore we should have it. I, there's a lot of effort gone into producing this. As we all know, Leicester's hospitals traditionally have missed out on loads of investment. And we've ended up with some really weird um, situations in the city where stuff's distributed in, a, un, I think, in a unsustainable way, which has caused financial problems for the trust in the past. And I'd just I'd like to say, I think the idea of looking at the birthing centre in the city you know, reviewing it after a year rather than giving it as a thing that uh, Councillor Kittrick came up with, I think is sensible. We just sort of come back and say, is this working? Yes, carry on with it. Um, and I just think, you know, we we sound like we're whinging about a massive investment and we shouldn't be. We should be applauding it. There are aspects we might not like much because of what's happened in our local area, but overall it should mean an improvement in services to all our residents across the city and the county. And that's where I'm coming from this chair. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. Totally agree with you. Um, I probably doesn't need a comment from the, the officers because I think it's obviously there. Uh, Ted. 
yeah, it, it's appreciated that the the issue specifically of the um, the maternity that we've been covering uh, is raising much emotions. But this is the the one of the the right forums to be discussing this. But to repeat, uh, there's another week to go, and um, there have been plenty of uh, webinars and uh, other forms of workshop, and. Uh, it seems as if this meeting is causing high emotion uh, amongst some people, and uh, that's understood. Um, but what I would say is two things. One, in order to um, calm an issue down, is whether the company that are looking at the processing, the, the consultation results, would be able to uh, independently verify the, the 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 website traffic, and uh, secondly, um, in terms of interpretation of, of what we've had so far, what what I I would like to to convey is that for, for the vast majority of the of the uh, two and a half hours uh, we've been talking, um, we've been privileged to have some very uh, experienced. NHS professionals and um, and leaders in uh, in providing our care, and for that I'm, I am very grateful and thankful for your time. Thank you very much, Ted. Yeah, good good comments, uh, Melissa. Uh, thank you. Um, I, oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, I think just. I guess I want to kind of um, clarify my comments today. It's precisely because of how great an opportunity this is for the uh, LLR area and um, for the city that I that I make the comments that I make and now is the time to be making them for the next 50 years. And so I'm sorry if people feel like we're um, going over old ground, but for those of us who are raising these concerns, we aren't feeling, I'm sure I don't speak for everyone, of course, but we aren't feeling like we're getting answers to all of them. So I just, it's not that we don't support the investment. We just want it to be the right investment. Um, and I just uh, think it's probably just worth uh, clarifying that. Chair, I have got um, a question about, but it's not, it's about bed numbers, really. Is that? Yep. Um, yep. No, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I was looking at my list of themes that we've, one item has been obviously a, a heavily uh, pushed uh, and bed numbers is clearly on my list. So, yeah, go on. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> again, you know, at the risk of going over old ground. Um, I have raised concerns all along about the bed numbers and uh, these concerns were allayed uh, quite uh, a lot at the private briefing that um, we had. So thank you to everyone involved in that and especially for the clinicians who who came along to that and were really helpful. I think my concern continues to be um, that we won't have finished building the hospitals by the time our modelling for bed numbers runs out. So this is how many beds we need. Oh, we're still building the hospitals <laughs> with that number of beds in. So my question is, is it possible that we will have run out of bed spaces before we even finish uh, building the, the changes here, please? Yep, good one. <coughs> Anybody left? <laughs> yes, Mark. Are you any chance of answering that one? You seem to be the, the man with the beds in your head. The numbers. <laughs> uh, yes. So where, where should I start? So, I, I mean, I, I won't repeat Councillor March, the, the stuff we talked about three or four weeks ago when we had the session specifically on beds. Bar one bit, which was the bit I said at the end, which was essentially... Anybody who says they know what's going to be happening in the NHS or in society in a decade's time is either a soothsayer, a philosopher or a liar. <laughs> and what I mean by that is um, we pretty much have a, a good grasp of what's going to happen to LLR population. We have a good grasp of what we would like to do in terms of models of care. We have a very good grasp in terms of what works. And uh, you've heard me say it before, but keeping people in hospital beds for for longer than they need to be is absolutely, again, everything we understand and know about good care. Um, 
So the bed model that we've currently got, I think the figures I showed you, it showed that actually compared to population growth, it's enough. If, if, you, if you come at it the other way around and say, OK, should we let's, let's let's go to absurd positions in order to prove the point. But should we double our bed numbers? So go from 2000 to 4000 beds. I mean, we could do that. It will cost an absolute fortune. We probably couldn't start. Well, we definitely couldn't staff them. But the impact of that is that yet again, the acute sector, the big hospitals in this city and if the rest of the NHS did it up and down the country, would suck all the money out of the healthcare system. And we'd be having a conversation in two or three years' time about the lack of investment in mental health, the lack of investment in primary prevention and public health, and the lack of investment in community services. So our job in the acute sector is to be big enough to cope, but no bigger than necessary. So are our bed numbers right? They're right as we stand here today. We think they're right in five years' time. In 10 years' time, we think they're still right. But you've heard me say before, in fact, I think the last but one slide of what I talked you through as councillors three or four weeks ago said if it is all wrong or something in the world changes, which means our fundamental assumptions around models of care get blown out of the window, we've got the latitude to, to build bigger should it be necessary. Mm -hmm. But you won't find clinicians here on any of our wards at the moment. They want more beds now, but they don't want to be staffing acute hospitals that frankly sometimes look like care homes. <laughs> So I, I, I can't, I, I mean, it's not a technical answer, but I think actually this isn't, it's, it's almost come to the point where actually this is a d discussion around what do we want the NHS to be in future? Yeah. And I don't want it to be a hospital centric where all the money gets sucked out by people like us because that, that isn't what the NHS is for. It's the National Health Service, not the National Treatment Service. And yet what we do now is treat people at the point of crisis because the investment doesn't exist in the rest of the system. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That's uh, fresh out of my head. That's exactly what I would have said. Um, the um, uh, Just, I think, try to put a context here. Um, I mean, Ian Scudamore has been around, what, since 1990-something. Um, my three kids were born uh, earlier than that. Um, all three were born at the Royal Infirmary Maternity Hospital, uh, soon to be the Children's Hospital. Um, and the professor looking after my wife, Professor McVicker it was at the time, um, insisted, not, not asked her, he insisted she stayed in hospital for a week for each of the th three uh, births. That was the thing in those days. Um, that was discussed with her, discussed with us. Um, it's different. We are I'll not say centuries later, but dozens of years later, and the pattern has changed. Uh, what we've had from flow today, a whole load of information I didn't know about, um, about the way midwives involve so much more. So it is different. I think we need to move on from that. Uh, Patrick, sorry. 